I want to welcome everybody to um, North Country Live. Um, this is uh, a pretty exciting night for us. Every Thursday night for the last uh, well, about a month and a half, we've been having a, a great um, you know selection of programs that have really kind of help to enrich the community and in topics that maybe folks have heard a little bit about, but maybe don't know, you know, as much as they'd like to, um, or at least, um, you know, the sort of hope is that through this, we can try and explore, have some good conversations and come away with a little bit more knowledge and, um, you know, expertise and some important issues in the Adirondacks as well as other things. So North Country Live for people that are new to the series um, is a program at North Country Community College, we started about a year ago. Um, as we've all kind of been looking back retrospectively at this time you know, of the, of the uh, month, you know, uh, in March of 2020, um, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, we're at the outset of it. Um, and we really wanted to present some programs that help to um, spark conversations, um, keep our communities enriched, and, um, you know, bring some of our partner organizations to the forefront of um, to different audiences that they may not may not have um, had the chance to um, to uh, see. So um, we've provided about 20 programs so far since we started this last year: wellness, personal finance, history. Um, we had a series on uh, the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe last fall. Those are some of the a few a few of the topics we've covered so far. Um, this spring semester of programs. Um, which I'll mention is sponsored by International Paper um, and their Ticonderoga Mill. So thank you to them for their sponsorship. Um, this series has been focused to on more environmental issues and topics. We had a great session last week on managing recreation in the high peaks. And then next week, we're partnering with the Wild Center's um, Youth Climate Program to bring in a group of uh, youth, youth climate leaders and have them share their experiences and their ideas um, for climate action. So uh, if you want to tune in next week at the same time, you'll be able to catch that uh, program. So um, that brings us tonight to tonight. We're excited to partner with the Adirondack Watershed Institute at Paul Smith College to have a really um, you know, timely and important conversation about water quality threats in the Adirondacks. And in particular, we're going to focus tonight on road salt reduction efforts in the park. And we're lucky to have three people tonight who've been really at the forefront of this issue. And they each uh, you know, bring a different perspective to the discussion. So um, I'd like to introduce Dan Kelting. Dan is executive director of the Watershed Institute, and that is a program that's focused on protecting clean water and promoting healthy watersheds. Uh, Dan studies the impacts of human activities on the environment and works collaborative, collaboratively with others to develop science-based solutions to environmental problems like road salt. So um, Welcome to Dan. Dan, say hi. <laughs> hi, everybody. Good evening. It's great to be here, Chris. Thank you. Great to be here with, with Brittany and, and my good friend, Chris Nowitzki, as well. And yeah, thanks for, for being with us, Dan. Um, so Chris, Chris Nowitzki is the Lake George Waterkeeper, um, and that's a program that's in its 19th year. It was launched by the Fund for Lake George. Uh, Chris's program applies research science and engineering principles for water quality protection through initiatives like low impact development, uh, sustainable winter management, algae uh, biomonitoring, and septic system management. So a lot of different areas. Um, and Chris is a licensed professional engineer, and he's a graduate of uh, SUNY ESF in, in Syracuse. Welcome, Chris. Great. Right. Thanks so much, Chris. Appreciate it. This is a great program. And Brittany Christensen is with us as well. Brittany is the executive director of ADK Action, a nonprofit membership organization that's been working to reduce road salt in the Adirondack region, among other things, since it's, uh, its founding back in 2011. And Brittany also serves as the coordinator for the Adirondack Road Salt Working Group. So um, Brittany, thanks for being here. We still have her? Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure yeah. to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And we are on this sort of, uh, when you talk, you you're, you show up on the screen Zoom webinar for people that are in the listening audience there. So that's just one thing to note. And for people that are listening, if you have a question or a comment you'd like to submit to the panelists, you can use the chat or there's a Q&A feature um, in this webinar as well. So um, feel free to jump in at any time. And we'll try to get folks, uh, our panelists uh, here to answer those questions. So just to, to start off, 
though, I think it's important for us to kind of lay the groundwork of, you know, why this is an important issue. Um, so I'm going to have Dan, you know, kind of take that first series of questions about, you know, for let's kind of start at the, with the basics, you know, what is salt? Why do we use it? Um, and, you know, why do we care about it? Why is this kind of, a, you know, an important issue for us here? So Dan, um, We'll start with the science. Maybe that's yeah, the best way to do it, right? Well, great. Well, thanks, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be. I'll try to be brief. Uh, so, so first, what is what is salt? So, so common road salt is a naturally occurring mineral. It's called halite. Uh, it's actually uh, the chemical formula: uh, sodium chloride (Na) for sodium, uh, Cl for chloride. It's the same exact salt that if you go to buy a one of those cardboard uh, cylinders of Morton salt at, at uh, Hannaford or Price Chopper or whatever your local store is. Uh, it's the same exact salt we use on our food. I have here, uh, I didn't have, it. I'm in my office, all I could find was this big box, but here's a big box of <laughs> kosher salt. Um, this is actually from New York State. So is it one thing that's interesting about the salt story is New York State is historically one of the largest producers of, of salt uh, in North America, actually in the world. Uh, this is produced by Cargill International, which is all, not only a producer of salt that we consume, but the largest producer and distributor of, of the salt we're talking about tonight, which is road salt. And the, the key ingredient on here is, is sodium chloride. So, so it's, the same, it's the same salt. When we're talking about road salt, it's the same salt that, that uh, we're putting on our, we put on our food and uh, I put a lot of salt a lot of salt on my food, I'm a salt, salt addict. Uh, you may, uh, if anybody here, is, I mentioned ESF, so Chris is an ESF grad, I'm an ESF grad. Uh, Syracuse University, the Orangemen uh, used to be called the Saltine Warriors. Uh, Syracuse was the salt city, it was the salt capital of, of North America. And the world's largest salt mines are actually actually in New York State. So we have a, we have a large history, history with this substance, uh, road salt. Um, so, so why is it, so why do we use uh, road salt on our roads? Well, um, it's used, it's used to, to um, either prevent the formation of ice. So, so we live in an area where we have ice storms. And so salt is very effective at preventing ice formation. It's also used to prevent snow from bonding to the surface of the road. So when the plow comes along, it's able to push the snow off the road and prevent hard pack from forming. So, so People, what, oftentimes when you're driving, uh, and you probably you hear this comment a lot, you'll see it. Why is it, why is the truck throwing out salt when there's no snow? That's the best practice. You want to put the get a layer of salt brine on the road so that you don't actually have a snowpack on the road. Uh, so it's used it's used as part of winter road management to to keep ice off the roads, to make the roads safe, to keep snowpack from forming on the roads, so to facilitate to facilitate plowing. Why do we use, there are, other, there are other substances available. Why do we use this particular substance? It's cheap, it's cheap compared to most other substances. I mentioned it's, it's mined from the ground. So, so it's mined, it's naturally occurring. So it's, re, it's very, very abundant and it's relatively cheap. Um, to your other question about why, why we care. So I think I covered kind of the first two, why, why we care about salt. Um, I mentioned it's cheap, right? So it's, it's, it's cheap to purchase relative to other things, but it's expensive when we think about its potential consequences. And this is an area where, so Chris and Brittany and I and others have been working on this part. I think I wanna kind of put this in perspective. We think about how long have we been using uh, sodium chloride or road salt on our road network in the Adirondacks since about 1980, so over 40 years. If you total that up, that's about 7 million tons of material, 7 million tons of salt over 40 years. That's over one ton per acre of land. So that, that's a lot of material. So if we spread that all over the Adirondacks, it would be over one ton per acre, but it was only put on the roads. So it's a tremendous amount of material just to put in one spot. It's not on the roads, right? It's, it's, it's run off the roads and gone out into our ecosystems. And so this is where this is where the potential concerns come in for, for, for us. And they kind of fall into, I would say three buckets of concern. The, the first bucket would be environmental. Uh, the second bucket would be human health. And the third bucket I would call 
pocketbook bucket or the economy. And so if we think about the environmental bucket, um, something that most people notice when they're driving down the side, driving down the road, they see a lot of dead trees. So uh, white pine trees, birch trees, uh, very susceptible to salt. So, so salt kills trees. Uh, trees through the root systems hold the earth together. So, so when you kill the trees that are on the side of the road, uh, you have a potential for serious erosion and that eroded material ends up in the water. So, so you kill the trees, you end up with, with a connection with uh, degraded water quality. There's also a lot of animals that, that are sensitive to, to salt. So amphibians, frogs, uh, uh, salamanders are sensitive to salt. They're actually, uh, salt can be lethal to these organisms. Uh, big big uh, deer and, and moose like salt. And so they come to the side road, they lick the salt, they get hit by cars. So that, that's a, actually, that's a lethal kind of human wildlife negative interaction type of thing there. When we go, salt moves down through the system. So it's, it's moving through the soil, it's getting into surface water. And in the surface water, there, there, there are a number of potential negative impacts on the environment. Uh, one of those kinds of comes up through, so people love to fish. So fishing is a big part of the Adirondack experience. We just had a, the Lake Colby Classic uh, virtually uh, this last weekend, uh, but the fish, the fish food are the small organisms in the lake, and a lot of those small organisms are impacted by salt. And we've, we've documented, as, as Lake, folks in Lake George, significantly elevated levels of salt in our water bodies in the Adirondacks to the point where the, a lot of water bodies are, are the organisms are being impacted by salt. So that, that's impacting the food web and impacting, uh, impacting the fishery. Another impact there is uh, one of the one of the ways people perceive water quality is water clarity. So how deep you can see in the water. Well, these organisms that are, that are impacted by salt, they eat the algae that actually cause the water to be cloudy. So if we have fewer of these organisms, we have more cloudy waters. So, so salt is also impacting water clarity. So these are, these are pretty profound uh, environmental environmental impacts of road salting, both terrestrial and aquatic. Uh, looking, at the, um, looking at the human health bucket, here uh, we've done a lot of work actually through sponsorship and partnership with, with the Fund for Lake George, Chris's group and the ADK Action, Brittany's group, uh, studying wells. So we've, we've uh, uh, studied wells throughout the Adirondacks. Most people in Adirondacks get their drinking water from a private well. And what we found is, uh, significant, profound, uh, high concentrations of sodium and chloride in people's drinking water, uh, exceeding actually over half the wells we sampled that are receiving salt water from state highways, exceed the drinking water standard for sodium for folks that are on low sodium diet. So, so it's a serious human health issue if you have a heart condition or you have some other condition where you're not supposed to drink high salt water. You can't taste the salt even if it's high, and unless it's really high. So people may be drinking high salt water unbeknownst to themselves. Uh, so that's a human, a direct human health concern. To the pocketbook issues, there are a number. I'll stick with the one with the groundwater. So, so I've been talking about sodium. Chloride is the other piece. And chloride is highly corrosive. So uh, there's been a lot of stories uh, uh, in the news and in our own data that once you have a chloride concentration in the water above 250 parts per million, that's a unit, you start to see failure of plumbing systems. Uh, so rust, corrosion, dishwashers, uh, hot water heaters, people have to buy expensive water treatment systems. So they're going out of pocket to be able to drink their water that was polluted by road salting. So that's a very serious uh, pocketbook issue. It's an issue for them if they try to sell their house and they have contaminated drinking water, it's going to be harder for them to sell their property. The last piece, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll shut up, uh, is the other pocketbook issue is our vehicles, right? right. So, so I don't know how many, I'm a, my cars all seem to fall apart from rust. Uh, that's causing me some serious, some serious financial difficulties as it does a lot of other people, brake wear, uh, gas uh, lines in your car, um, infrastructure, anything, uh, anything made out of metal, uh, except for aluminum, uh, uh, is going to rust, going to corrode. So 
Think about bridging infrastructure, guardrails. Think about the salt trucks themselves that are salting are actually rusting out too. So, so there's a lot of, there's a whole suite of, from, a, from the environment to the human health, to the pocketbook, all, a lot of profound impacts uh, from road salting. So I go back to the, it's cheap to purchase. It's fairly cheap to get it on the road. It's effective to a point, but then when you look at all these other potential negatives, uh, it may not be by itself the solution to, to effective management of wind roads. Dan, what, I, I want to get, get to Chris with a question here in a second, but I, you know, what was the trigger, you know, in the, the early 80s as to why all of a sudden this started to be such a, you know, we started to use salt so much more, um, yeah. you know, if somebody just realized, hey, this stuff's much more, much yeah. less expensive, it clears the roads clean, what, you know, why, why, why that, you know, the mm -hmm. last years, but not the 40 years before that? Yeah, so it's a great question, Chris. Uh, so the 40 years uh, before that, I was alive for some of those years. Before that. <laughs> that wasn't I remember. Uh, but but um, so sand abrasive was heavily used. Uh, yes. So that's one of the other alternatives. It's got problems. Uh, but so basically plowing and putting sand down to provide traction, that, that was pretty widely used in the region for, for quite a while. Uh, it it was criticized heavily as well uh, because, uh, as Chris can tell you, for his own for Lake George, it's causing significant impacts on the ecosystems of Lake George. So sand is not sand is not necessarily a better alternative all around than salt. It, it's got issues. It's so this this is sort of a legend. The, the answer to your question is I think more of a legend than a truth, but I'll just put it out there. Uh, so so because it's important to spread rumors, I think. So, so, so uh, it has to do, so the Winter Olympics, 1980. So, so uh, this is where the widespread use of road salting can be clocked to is um, the Winter Olympics and having the roads, having the roads clear and, and drivable, easily drivable for, 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 for that event. And then, and basically at, every year thereafter, uh, we, we've had, we basically set up a, an expectation of having our roads be, uh, well, we achieved it then, people liked it, we've continued it. Uh, certainly they're safe, they're drivable, it's convenient, it's, it's easy to move trucking. But I think it started, that's, that's the lore, that's the story that, I, that I've heard over and over again, is it started right around then to, for, to create the conditions for safe driving and high speed driving uh, in the middle of the winter during the Olympics. And it's basically persisted, uh, persisted ever since. And I don't know if Chris or, or Brittany ha have an addition to that legend or, or a subtraction. <laughs> Is that your knowledge as well, Chris? That that's the, the legend uh, has some truth to it there. Well, I, I wasn't around at that time up here, but that's yeah. I mean, that's what people point to. You know, Dan talked to um, sand, sand being a concern, and the big thing I think it. I think it really around Lake George, it may have been closer to the you know, early 90s because Lake George is actually impaired due to sediment and sand. So Dan's correct that it, it, it sand can impact our waters as well. <clears throat> and DEC you know, deemed Lake George an impaired water body due to sediment. And we're seeing Delta buildups. Uh, so that's why I think it, it's funny because you know, part of our programs, we were working with the highway departments directly. And they were like, oh, you, you environmentalists told us to stop using the sand. So we moved to salt. And now you're telling us to stop using salt. So they're like, well, what do we do? And that's, you know, one of the things that we did. And I, I liked the one line from Dan's uh, uh, bio intro was, um, science solutions you know that's one of our mottos is science to solution so we use the science it starts with the science and to have that drive the solution so and how has that um you know how has that come about in, in lake george you know can you tell me a little bit about some of the efforts you you know in the fund for lake george have have made to try and uh, work with highway departments work with the Absolutely. state um, as, as it, it started with Dan and I'll throw some like Dan said with the science 
we've monitored Lake George big water body. Um, we've seen the chloride levels triple over 40 years. So they're still well below what the toxic levels are, but our streams get much, much higher. Um, but also the numbers, 30,000 tons of salt is applied in the Lake George Basin every year. And if you put those in railroad cars, that would be a line of railroad cars, 300 cars, three miles long. So that, that's a lot of salt. So uh, at the fund, we, we innovated what we call the model for protection. We call it partnership, innovation, and investment. So we, we partnered. We, we actually started it with an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding. We, we actually started meeting to address the issue of invasive species. And while we were at the table with our elected officials, eight municipalities around the lake, three counties, um, we just spelled out an MOU to take a look at this issue. We spelled the science out, what the impacts were, and developed a program that we would commit to work with the municipalities. We would commit to bring in information and experts on the best techniques and technology. And, uh, you know, we'd work with the superintendents to study and monitor what was being put down. And we actually agreed to host um, a SALT summit every year, which our first one was in 2015. Um, we've held them annually up until last, uh, last year when nobody was having, you know, conferences and Brittany's partnered with us and, and been a co-sponsor for, for most of those. Um, but what we did is bring the experts in because I'm, I may be an engineer, but I, I'm not a plow operator. I don't know the best technology. So we partnered with companies from uh, Canada, you know, Metal Plus to bring in the, the live edge plow. We worked with a couple consultants that knew winter maintenance operations, Wood Advisors, Phil Sexton, um, Rakib O'Meara, you know, uh, who has a company, Viasis, up in Waterloo, Canada. You know, we always say we want to reduce road salt, but if we don't know what we're putting down, how can we reduce it? So that's where we started was to really put the trackers in the truck. So that was our second part, innovation. We actually became the first watershed to measure and put these black boxes or GPS data trackers. So we knew every 30, 40 seconds what trucks were putting down throughout the watershed. Then we actually started putting cameras alongside of the road that took images every 15 minutes and we could compare the actual road conditions, the level of service to the salt applications and started working with the, the plow drivers in that way. We also, uh, and, and that ties into our third part, the investment. So the fund actually invested, provided grants to towns. We actually became a distributor wholesale for live edge plows, which instead of a straight 12 foot blade, this had six two foot blades that would contour and move to the road and conform similar to the way a, a razor would go across the face. Well, you may not know that Chris, but others do with it. <laughs> um, but, we also started work, <laughs> but we also started working with a brine, you know, to start putting brine down and tracking that. And through that, that's the way that we started reaching out, developing partnerships and developing, you know, support with the superintendents initially, you know, a couple of them were, you know, these are hardworking guys can be pretty, pretty crusty guys and, and they're in their way of doing things. And to have somebody come in to tell them to do it differently. So it, it developed, it, it took time to develop the friendships, trust. But once they started seeing their numbers going down and some of the towns in Lake George, around Lake George, we were able to reduce their salt budgets by 50% now. So, you know, so it's, it was through that partnership, innovation, investment to, and showing that we were making a commitment to bring in these experts, but also to put some money up into the game and, and help these guys. And, and they're mostly guys. There's also girls and women that are out there doing it. But I think, um, you know, so it, it took a bit to get their trust, but now they stand up. And at our recent SALT summits, they are actually probably the lead presenters because now they can tell the story peer to peer and 
And that's when we think we've really reached, you know, kind of the promised land is when these guys can tell the story, talk the lingo, and really, uh, you know, drive that point home. Yeah, you have to get that buy-in. And it sounds Absolutely. like you've worked for years to really get that successfully there. It, it was, and it, it takes, you know, because, but, but to connect with them, you know, it's, it, it's a lot of it's the water quality and really that's a, a big impact, but it's also talking about the fish as Dan said, these, these uh, operators are all fishermen like the outdoors. Uh, they all have families here and they, their kids are coming, growing up. So they want their children to experience what we've been fortunate enough to have. So, you know, that's where we started connecting, you know, it's not like, you know, we don't talk milligrams per liter with them and all that. But now we got these guys talking about pounds per lane mile, and it became actually kind of a competition with them to, you know, reduce and see who's doing a better route. And, you know, as, as Dan said, we, we all start with science. Well, we've carried science through this and, you know, have actually used the data to, you know, show the reduction in the amounts and really how the drivers can maintain safe roads while possibly reducing their salt load in half so you know it, it makes sense and it's a win-win and 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 the residents started getting behind it as well so excellent that's a that's a great story and let me ask Brittany to kind of expand on that a little bit because you know now you know when you look at what's been done in Lake George it's a great example of how you know progress can be made how can you take that regionally and I know that's something that's been really important to ADK action so maybe Brittany could you tell me a little bit about you know, how, what role ADK Action has played in this, um, you know, since, since 2011? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Chris. Thank you. Um, so ADK Action is, um, you know, has come at this really from the grassroots level in a lot of ways. Um, when we were founded, it was actually a lot of residents meeting in each other's living rooms, talking about issues that mattered to them. And, um, and our founders did a big community survey and through conversations in the survey identified the overuse of road salt as one of the biggest issues of mutual concern in the Tri Lakes region. Um, and like, a, this is about a decade ago. So, you know, starting from that place of knowing that there was a problem, um, Lee Keat, one of the founders of our board reached out to Dan Kelting and also partnered with Adirondack Council and put their heads together and came up with a study. Um, Dan and his team at AWI produced this great document, um, the Review of Effects um, document. It's a, it's a booklet kind of outlining, outlining um, a literature review at the time and all of the known negative impacts, all of the known best practices at that time. And so our organizations teamed up and we put on SALT conferences um, at Paul Smith's early on before my time. Um, there were four early SALT conferences up here before I was hired, and then I came on board in 2016, and um, we really started meeting together as a core team, so uh, Dan Kelting here, Chris Nowitzki, and then our, our dear friend, the late Randy Preston, was our co-chair of that team, um, along with Lee Keat, and you know, all of us just, you know, have been meeting over the years and trying to move this issue forward and come up with a regional strategy. And so ADK Action's been, you know, keeping in good touch with our members to hear about their concerns, um, homeowners that have been impacted by road salt, especially. Um, it's really devastating what families go through when they have that salt contamination. I mean, it's thousands and thousands of dollars. And oftentimes folks will have to drill a new well at their own expense. And depending on the groundwater on their property, they might drill a new well and tap into the same contaminated groundwater. So it's really a big problem. Um, so we've, we've really come at this at, with an attitude of whatever it takes to solve the problem. So, you know, forming these strong relationships and partnerships and, um, you know, we saw the, the great progress that was happening down in Lake George, and we thought it was silly to have two separate conferences, so we joined forces. And then um, we also reached across the lake and formed a great partnership with the folks at Lake Champlain Sea Grant. Um, they've got a really good salt prog um, program over there. And so not last year because of COVID, but the year before, <clears throat> we all teamed up and had one giant salt summit, um, the Adirondack Champlain Regional Salt Summit. So <clears throat> that I think um, 
was really wonderful because it brought together all of the great work and case studies that are happening um, throughout the Champlain Basin and beyond. Um, and so we've been happy to play that role. And we're also always you know, trying to communicate what's happening with the road salt issue to Albany. So we love to take you know, Dan's research and the great stories of um, what's happening in Lake George and bring those to Albany and try to get attention on these issues. So, um, and we saw that, uh, you know, what happened last year, uh, late last year when the governor signed, um, you know, the, the Randy Preston named Road Salt Reduction Act, you know, advocacy and forming these partnerships has been such a, um, an important part of this. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how it came about and, you know, some of the specifics of what, what that entails? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we've got this uh, Adirondack Road Salt Working Group that Randy Preston was a co-chair of before his passing. And um, we had come up with a, with a unified strategy for trying to take some of the great um, science that we learned about um, through Dan's work and spread that throughout the region and take some of the best practices and the proven techniques from the Fund for Lake George. And we also copied the MOU model. Um, Chris was kind enough to let us take the MOU that he developed for Lake George and we developed a regional version. And we started sharing that um, around the whole Adirondack region. We've got 26 municipalities who've signed on. Um, so together we really built a critical mass of awareness about the issue. Um, we gave a lot of talks, we put on a lot of events and you know, after some time um, and strategy and bringing you know, bringing the stories of people who've been impacted down to Albany and bringing the science down to Albany, um, eventually our voices were heard and eventually, um, you know, Billy Jones, Assemblyman Billy Jones, uh, really stepped up as an amazing leader, um, along with, you know, Assemblyman Dan Steck uh, and Senator Betty Little. And um, Billy wrote a bill and he was kind enough to offer us the opportunity to give some feedback. And what we, what we really identified over the years is that we need a regional strategy. You know, the Adirondacks are just such an incredible resource and we've got these beautiful pristine lakes and we've got our forest preserve and to poison our waters with this road salt is, is an absolute shame. And it's not just happening here, it's happening in other parts of the state, it's happening in other states across the country, it's happening in other parts of the world. Um, but we've got, you know, we've got a lot of stewards of this beautiful place, of this park, and we've got the right um, solutions. You know, we've got the right solutions, we've got the science, so this is the place to do it. So we came up with this idea for a park-wide pilot. You know, maybe statewide is too much. There's a lot of considerations um, when you start to look at, you know, maintaining urban roadways versus rural. But what if we could just look at the Adirondack Park geographically and start to prioritize salt reduction methods. Um, so ultimately what Billy Jones, you know, uh, put together in the, in the bill was a task force um, that would be made up of all the right experts, um, engineers, scientists, um, everyone that you would need to make some great decisions and lay out a plan for the parkwide pilot. And then the plan is that after the task force completes their study, um, which is a one year, uh, one year study and report, then there'll be a three year pilot program to really you know, test out some of, the, um, some of the recommendations from the task force and, and see what we can't do to make some serious change in the region. That's great. And how far along is the task force and its work at this point? I believe, is it towards the end of this coming year when their um, recommendations are expected to come out? Do, do we know? Well, the task force hasn't been appointed yet. Um, okay. So the next step is for the um, task force members to be appointed and then the group will officially get started. Um, and my understanding is that it'll be, you know, once the task force is formed, then it'll be a, a one year period of time from then. That's great. Let me ask Dan, as someone that, you know, has been studying this issue, um, you know, researching it for so many years, um, and to get to the point where we have this, you know, this, this statewide legislation that's really kind of, you know, taking the Adirondacks and putting it out there as, you know, here, we're going to, we're going to be the pioneers of this. We're going to uh, um, you know, try to make some effective change. How did that feel to you to kind of get that across the finish line uh, as someone who's kind of been in the trenches of this, so to speak, for quite a long time?
Dan, are you on there? Are you are you muted? Sorry about that. I muted. No problem. I saw Chris muted. Hey, I always do what Chris does. Mute <laughs> Uh, sorry, I, I told I thought I had a good line too. It's gone. Uh, so yeah, um, it feels so. Yeah, saying that it it it, it feels very gratifying uh, as a scientist to to see see one's work play a role in in informing policy. It's it's very rare uh, that that ever happens in anybody's science science career. It's usually you publish your work, you present your paper, and you go on to the next thing. I th I think. It's so, and a couple of reasons it happened um, is one is the, the, the results are so clear. Uh, so, so the data set's very clear, it speaks for itself. Uh, two, we had a great team of people willing, um, going to meet with the key people uh, like Chris and Brittany and, and our good friend, Randy Preston and Lee Key got us, got us to the right people to talk, tell the story. And I think we, so we were able to communicate the science and, and learn how to tell the story. It was a calibration about how to tell it. Uh, but, but we were able to, through a nice, through a nice collaboration, um, communicate over and over again uh, to, to the right people, people that would listen. And, and, um, and the story, again, was compelling enough that, that folks, folks really uh, stood up and listened. And I think I was going to mention uh, the Common Ground Alliance. Remember, so in 2019, I think it was, we had uh, that's another wonderful group of Adirondackers that are that are grassroots group at the park level that that comes together every summer on on big issues. And so they agreed to have a road salt group, and so we were all on that group. and And I believe the idea of the Randy Preston road salt bill was a product of that working group. Uh, and so we talked about the science and everybody was there to talk about the policy and boom, we had this initiative, let's get a bill for the park. And so that was another group working with, with a group. And so it's a, it's a great example of, of science, science being used to help inform policy and then other, and then groups all getting together to work together to, for a common cause. I think that the Adirondacks is, is the perfect place too, because the Adirondacks is the only place in New York, well, maybe the Catskills has one of these, but the Adirondacks was formed to protect water. So, so and here we have a clear evidence that the, the, the water is being compromised by, in fact, by practices largely done by the state. So, so, so it was a, it's a clear case for the, the geographic focus, it's a clear case for the geographic focus in the Adirondacks because of the constitution and the formation of the park and the reason why, why we have a park is to protect the water. And, and so and we were able to use science to, to show in fact that the water was being compromised through our work, through Chris's work and others, and then, and then bring it all up. And I love, I love the process of being able to work with all these folks uh, as a scientist, it's been really gratifying. Let me, let me follow that up with a question that uh, was submitted here in the chat or in the Q and A that, um, while it's been obviously great to get the, you know, the, the ball across the goal line with this legislation, um, the question was, since we know so much about the impacts of road salt, why do we need to study it for a year before conducting a pilot program? Uh, and that's kind of a good question. You, you, you know, Dan or Chris, you know, or Brittany, feel free to answer that. But, um, you know, why we know, we know what the impacts are already, it seems like. So, um, why can't we, you know, work towards a pilot program? starting out of the out of the gate hi um well there you know there are i think that's a great question um and i do want to you know I'll, I'll tip my hat to to randy um you know god rest his soul because that was one of the ways we were we got so much strength down in albany was to go with an elected official you know and and have him lead us at a table so his his help and his leadership was instrumental in this and and I, you know, our approach on the on the task force bill, I, we think it's a great measure, um, you know, but, you know, some of our beliefs here, like George, is that we feel we've, we have found an answer. There is a, there are a couple pilot studies, small scale, um, one in Lake George, one up in, in uh, Lake Placid, but we felt that, you know, we, we've got 
some pretty good uh, people here and pretty good programs that, that we could point to for a model. So, um, you know, I worked with, with uh, Brittany and with Dan and, and Lee and others on this uh, bill, but, you know, I was, I was one and I'm, I'm still one to, to lean towards, we've already got the answers, you know, and let's implement them right now. We're seeing what's happening. We've, we've had a lot of outreach and meetings with DOT, um, you know, and I, I, you know, it's, 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 sometimes it's a bit frustrating when, when the smaller guys have to appear to be the leaders, but, um, you know, I, I sure. feel that we've got a lot of answers going on already. Um, and let's, let's start reducing it and putting, we have the science and we've got the solutions and let's start putting them into, into practice right now. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't disagree with a word of that, Chris. And I think, I think related to the question that, uh, that the person posed, um, certainly we don't need to be, we don't need to continue to document the impacts, the impacts are, the impacts are clear, uh, we will want to, however, document whatever to document whether things that we try work. So, so we use science to, to monitor, and, and and so Chris is able to say that uh, the work in Lake George is effective because he's monitoring it using scientific methods. So, so, the, so the science I think is to is to monitor. I think where the where um, the task force is important is is. Um, Hopefully, the, I think the expectation of us on, well, if we're, if we're on the task force, whoever's on the task force, we'll be able to look at the things that are being done at Lake George, look at things being done at other states and bring them to the table in an open fashion so that it's not just one agency or another saying yes or no to this thing. It's, it's everybody has an equal seat and we're able to look at the totality of options. We've got some working in Lake George and, they're, and science is showing that they're working. Uh, let's see how those can be, how those and other options can be uh, brought up to scale uh, for the park and what resources are needed to do that. And so, so I'm, I think the task force can, is a vehicle for that, I'm hoping. Yeah, that sounds like an important approach. and. and at the same time, I don't want to uh, gloss over the fact that you, I mean, your research, Dan, has shown that in terms of where, uh, you know, the biggest impacts are in the park, you know, it's along the state highways. Am I right? It, you know, as much as local municipalities and their towns and roads and their, you know, plowing practices are important here, the bigger impact is along those, you know, roads that the state plows and, and uses salt on. Is that correct? Yeah, so at the so at the park scale, so so I work at uh, I work at the park scale. So so when you look at that scale, certainly it's it's at it's uh, it's this at, uh, the salting of the state highways because they're all treated the same. They all get the same roughly the same amount of salt every year. So the results are consistent. Uh, so when you look at the park, when you look but when you look start looking at different municipalities, look so. Some municipalities have historically followed the state practices, and so some will have similar. Uh, so we, we do see uh, impacts uh, in wells located near local roads too. Those just happen to be using the similar practices as, as the state. So, so at, but at the scale of the park, as a regional issue, uh, getting a handle on the state's practices will have the biggest impact on the region, but that doesn't mean local work shouldn't also happen as Chris has demonstrated in Lake George. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's important. And, you know, I, you know, I, I'm kind of reminded from, you know, my days as a reporter that when we talk about some of these big issues in the Adirondack Park, it's often in some of the bigger communities that have some more resources they can bring to bear like a Lake George, like a Lake Placid, where, you know, we see some things, uh, see, you know, some, some change start to happen. Um, but some of the smaller communities in the park sometimes can struggle with trying to make those kinds of changes. Um, and that's obviously, a, you know, I think why you're all saying that we really need to have kind of a, 
a, you know, a park-wide solution or a park-wide approach to this, right? And I'll just add like one point to that, because it's a good point. We see some of the largest impacts uh, to groundwater in Hamilton County. Mm-hmm. And Hamilton County is not Warren County or Essex County. It's, it's, it's a much le- lower level of resource availability. Uh, so about a lot of well contamination along along the high, state highway in Hamilton County. So, so yeah, sorry to interrupt you, Brittany. And, and to that, that's where I think, you know, the work that Brittany's done is has been, you know, much harder and, and, you know, monumental in a way to take this to these smaller towns that have much smaller budgets. I mean, we, we're in small town, the, the town I live in, town of Hague, you know, 800 people, but you know, there's there's smaller towns across across the park, and you know, to try to get these towns, which are much smaller budgets, you know, to reach out and and try these new things, it's it, it takes a lot of work. You know, so um, hats off to Brittany for you know taking the what we found here and trying to bring it elsewhere. And um, you know, and and as Dan said, that's part of a, what the task force will do is really to kind of raise this all up. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks for saying so. And you all have proven such a great model there that it's a no brainer to expand the model through the region. Um, So thank you for that. And I'd love to also talk for a moment about some other aspects of the task force and what the task force is tasked to do um, that I think really does make it critical. It would be great to just do everything we possibly can tomorrow. You know, there's so much that we already do know. Um, And I, I think that some of the work that DOT is doing now with the pilot areas is promising. And I think there is a culture change happening within DOT that's gonna be a really critical component of this. Um, You know, in speaking with folks from DOT for the last um, five years myself and hearing, you know, stories from the folks that came before me on this project, there really has been a a culture change. There's a lot more openness um, and willingness to come to the table. And, you know, that's very important. Um, so the task force, in, you know, in addition to being a study of some things we already know, it also includes right in the language of the law that the task force will make recommendations for rapid response best practices um, for the contaminated wells of homeowners. And that's so important because right now when someone's well is contaminated with road salt, they don't have anywhere to turn. There's a 90 day statute of limitations for trying to take legal action. And oftentimes um, folks have known that their water has been contaminated for many years. And so there's nothing they can do about it, but hemorrhage money and lose property value and be incredibly frustrated and have their quality of life suffer. Um, so, so that I'm really glad that, that that language was retained in the bill. That was something that we all fought for. Um, there's also um, a line in the bill about establishing a training program for state and local win- winter road maintenance workers. Um, and I think that some of the excellent work that's been done down in Lake George, thanks to Chris and his team, you know, hopefully will be included in that training program. So that's a really big win as well, um, because we need, we need the operators to know how to use the right amount of salt in the right conditions at the right time. And that's going to be a constant adjustment. Um, and finally, there's a, there's a um, line calling for a public outreach and education campaign. And if we go back to what Dan said earlier about the, the Olympics, um, you know, why did, why did the state decide to put a bunch of resources into clearing the roads? I mean, we were having millions of visitors from around the world coming to the area, and it was about keeping those people safe. It was about making sure that, you know, there was a flow of traffic. And as Dan mentioned, that created a new expectation, really raised the bar. And now, you know, when people want to get from Saranac Lake to Plattsburgh, uh, they want to do it in an hour. That's how long they want that to take year round. And, you know, I think we're, we're all used to that convenience. And um, there's been a lot of, there's, there's been studies and there's been a lot of thought put into the fact that um, it's, we can reduce road salt. It's been proven that we can reduce road salt significantly without making um, the roads less safe. So we're not, con- you know, of course, safety is always a primary concern, but we know it can be done. It's been done in other places. It's being done in Lake George. We can maintain safety, but we might have to sacrifice speed a little bit. We might have to slow down. We might have to, you know, maybe the task force will recommend snow tires, for example. Um, and so that public outreach component is going to be critical because it's really going to be a mindset shift for all of us. 
Um, and finally, I'd love to share just a quick story, a personal story. Um, a couple of years ago, my in-laws had just moved to the Adirondacks from Minnesota. And I had my baby son on my, on my hip and I was walking up um, the stairs to their apartment and I slipped cause it was icy and I, and it wasn't bad. You know, I got a little bruise on my knee. It was no big deal. But you, the next time that I went to my father-in-law's house, there was a ridiculous amount of salt. Oh, no. <laughs> he had poured <laughs> enough salt to kill a horse. Like it was, there was just a ridiculous amount of salt. And I had been working on this, on this salt project for years when that happened. And it just clicked in my head. I was like, that's why we do this. That's, you know, the oversalting yeah. comes from a good place. We're trying to take care of each other, keep each other safe. We're, you know, it's erring on the side of caution for human safety. But we've now realized that we are, you know, we're paying too high a price for that. And, um, and we're, I think, you know, trying to recalibrate expectations all around. Before we've got just a couple minutes left, but I did want to ask, you know, I think you've each hinted a little bit at, you know, other states, uh, other models out there, you know, other alternatives um, that other states are using. Could you, you know, mention any by name that you're familiar with? Like, you know, who is who is taking this issue on, you know, either as well as, you know, they're doing, say, in Lake George or, you know, uh, in other places that we could use as a model? Um, or are we the model? You know what I mean? I, I'll say, I can, I'll say a little bit, and then I think Chris and Brittany have so we had at one of the salt summits that we hosted at Paul Smith a number of years ago. We invited the, it was actually the commissioner of the DOT from Colorado came and, and talked about the practices that they use. Now, Colorado gets a lot of snow and Colorado's got, and it's got some serious elevation ch challenges, right? You go from Den Denver up to, to the Eisenhower tunnel, you're gaining thousands and thousands of feet in elevation. The climate is changing dramatically. Uh, so huge challenges uh, in, in how to manage those roads. And they have, um, uh, the way that they've done that um, is really through a lot of technology. And one piece of technology that, that, that we don't use as effectively in New York is, uh, is the weather. Uh, so they, the jar, jargon is a roadway weather information system. And what's important about that is oftentimes, in, I mentioned that the plow, the, the drivers will go out and salt the road before as a pre preventative for, for ice formation or snow pack forming on the road. Well, they might go out and do that. And, we, and we, it turns out we didn't get any snow or we didn't get any ice. We don't have the tech out. We don't have the sophistication that other states like Colorado do in terms of their forecasting in probability, knowing the probability of when they should salt and when they should uh, So that's really important because we oftentimes we saw and we really didn't need to. Um, or in, a, in, a, in the Congress too, so sometimes we don't salt when we should have. Uh, so, so we don't have that sophistication. Um, we don't, uh, the drivers think a lot on, on the fly about what they need to do, uh, but um, so they have technology. They also think about, they utilize different formulations, uh, which, which uh, so we talk about sodium chloride, but there's different formulations. There's calcium chloride, magnesium chloride. They use those formulations, uh, which are more, much more effective at lower temperatures as they're going up to the Eisenhower tunnel. They actually switch as they're moving up the road. Um, so, so there are, um, that's one example. Uh, so using technology, so wet because weather drives the decision making. So if you can understand the weather better, you can make a better better decision. You know, I would I would turn to uh, you know somebody who helped us at, at one of our summits, a keynote, um, Laura Fay, who is a woman from Montana State. You know, did a lot of good research and works with the Clear Roads Network. Um, so Montana State University, Montana does a lot of work and Laura Fay was her name. And, you know, we, we leaned on her and she actually got into the economics of it as well um, on, on how that saves money and return of investment and uh, things like that. And that's always important for municipalities or agencies. I'll just uh, toss in one last question we had from the chat before um, we wrap up and 
David had asked, are you getting much pushback from DOT, comma, politicians? Um, so what if your well is over salty? Just get bottled water for consumption. Um, <laughs> any, uh, anybody want to take that? I know that's, that's a little bit of a thorny question, but, uh, you know, do you get some put pushback from others? I mean, I would say not, we don't. I think, you know, we, I think, uh, going back to the trips to Albany, so we've presented this work, Chris, Chris, uh, Brittany, Randy, uh, we've sat uh, with the commissioner of DOT and his people, and we've shared the work, and, and, and we've never received any pushback from them in terms of, of, of uh, seeing, yep, that seems to be a problem. Uh, so I could, uh, so this question is a little more granular, I think, than, than that. So at the, at, the, at the commissioner level and his, his, his troops, um, uh, we, we've never had any pushback on the data. Um, I don't know, Chris, or... Well, we're, we're, you know, we partnered a lot with DOT um, and we just hope that that continues. As Dan said, we've actually started a monitoring program you know, for the pilot study along Lake George. And, you know, where we're, the key element that and key piece that we need is feedback from DOT on their application rates. So we're really uh, hoping that we can get that information from them so that we can validate, you know, the environmental benefits of, of this, you know, mini pilot study and uh, hopefully show that that can be part of a bigger one. Uh, that'll come through the task force. And Chris, I'll just add um, to the part of the question about, you know, so what if the well is over salty? Um, DOT has over the years um, paid to drill new wells for some folks um, that helped dried up, uh, no pun intended, a few years ago as the issue really started to um, become more apparent. But, um, but you know, there has, there has been some, some help, but it's, it's not reliable or systematic for the homeowners. Um, and it's been harder to come by more recently. So that's, that is a big problem and something that we're really hoping the task force will be able to help address and shed some light on. Um, but I'll echo that for the most part, DOT um, really has, uh, you know, worked with us and I think we'd all like to see change more quickly, but it's an incredibly big organization. It's a large bureaucracy, a lot of moving parts. Um, and so, you know, we're all trying to remain patient and, and uh, you know, happy to build relationships and, and do the work together. It's complicated, but not insurmountable, obviously, uh, you know, That's right. through those partnerships. Let me, let me close by asking you each, you know, to kind of sum up, I mean, what if, if I want, you know, want to know more about what I could do to, um, you know, be involved in this or help to protect, you know, uh, the waterways in my community or, um, you know, talk to, you know, the, the plow drivers in my community. What, what we, you know, what would you tell, you know, you know, the, the folks that are watching or other folks that might be watching this later about how they can kind of get involved in this or what more they should could do on their own? I'll start. I, I'll start up. I, I did put a link to a film that we had just put out, a roadmap to road salt reduction, success stories from Lake George. And I think that's uh, where I would turn people to right away. And there was a, a phrase that came up earlier, and that's what we really noticed when we put this film together. Um, culture change. It really is a change in, in the operator's mindset and the elected officials. So um, that's where I would encourage people to go. Uh, Dan, let me do it, or Brittany, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so um, on the ADK Action website, and I'm putting in a link in the chat now, um, we have a map of all the municipalities in the region who've signed on to the pledge, uh, the MOU. And so, you know, for everyone here that's attending tonight, take a look at that map. And if the municipality you live in or one adjacent or one where you have a relationship with the supervisor um, hasn't signed on yet, you can download the pledge right at the link that I'll share. Um, and you can ask the municipality to sign on. And we've recently received funding to do some more targeted outreach with our partners um, to, to really help, um, you know, to really help the municipalities make change at the local level. Excellent. 
Yeah, I, I would I would just add one uh, just related to Brittany's personal story. Uh, I think everybody should do their own salt audit. So it's salt reduction starts at home. Not 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 this part part you're putting on your on your food, but you know <laughs> um, that will be difficult. But but um, but how are you using salt on your on your porches and your steps and your road? Uh, so question your own use and and. Uh, limit that as much as possible, even get rid of it. Uh, maybe you don't even need to use salt. Uh, uh, so practice, sort of practice low salt yourself. And that will, that actually, and if you're a business, uh, if you're, if you're representing a business, your own business, businesses use a lot of salt. Uh, think about, think about reducing your salt use as a business. Uh, if you're a private homeowner and you're on a well, uh, I really encourage you to get your water tested. And if you haven't had it tested, knowing, knowing what your salt concentrations are, uh, particularly if you're more, if you're elderly, if you have health issues, uh, have, knowing whether or not your your water may be contaminated, and you don't even don't even know it. So just a health issue. I would say if um, if you're a member of an association, so so we work with a lot of lake associations and a lot of wells that we test are, are around lakes. Uh, those are those are natural groups to to for to to get together and talk about with, with their uh, local officials about their concerns related to salt. So the whole grassroots uh, ground up approach. For example, right now we're working with the Upper Saranac Watershed Group, uh, and road salt is one of their areas of concern, and that'll be something that will probably be part of their watershed management plan, and that of course has an implementation time frame. Uh, there's uh, folks in Lake Clear who, who have been particularly impacted by salt, have gone directly to the local DOT engineer, Department of Transportation engineer, and are, are engaging with him one-on-one. -on -one. These folks at the local level, they're part of the community and they wanna do what's right, right by their neighbors. Uh, so rather than going to Holiday, they're going to the local person and expressing their uh, concerns and trying to get trying to get um, uh, action at the local level. So, so I think um, have your well tested, check yourself in terms of salt use, uh, get organized with your neighbors uh, and talk and talk to the local officials uh, and, and tell them what, what your concerns are. Think global, act local, or, yeah, or think park wide, act local. <laughs> right. yeah, I'm struck kind of by the you know what some of the things you're saying and of last week's presentation on the, the high peaks where you know we can make change in the adirondacks sometimes it's like you know moving a bus uh you know it's a, it, it doesn't happen overnight but you know we used to go into play, camp at places like marcy dam and bury our trash and have campfires and run let our dogs run wild without leashes and yeah. over time those rules have changed and we've been able to adapt to them and you know make it you know a better place and yep. i think the same can really be said of of this issue as well that through a lot of the efforts of you know, the folks that are with us here tonight and and many other people who you know we named and we didn't name um you know we're gonna you know, be able to make that change over time um and this you know this is just a, another step in the right direction so i want to thank you all one for participating in this tonight and then two for all the work you've done on this issue, you know, from the science to the organizing to the advocacy, it's uh, it's great to hear hear the story. So, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Brittany, for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank thanks you. a lot, Chris. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you very right. much. Thanks, audience. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye. For those of you that um, aren't familiar on our North Country Live page, which is uh, nccc.edu slash live, we will have a recording of this um, presentation uh, available probably sometime tomorrow morning once I get it all edited. And uh, we'll have that up there if you want to turn uh, people uh, to that page, they can watch it. And then I also want to thank International Paper for sponsoring uh, our series as well. And tune in next week, this same time when we'll have uh, a great discussion about climate change and hear what some um, of our wonderful and talented and smart young people in our communities are doing to affect change in terms of uh, climate. So I hope you can tune in then, but uh, thanks again, everybody. And hope you have a great night. Thank you. Good night.